Hey guys, John McGrady here again with my fourth installment in the interview with a famous statistician series. And today it's an honor and a privilege to have Dr. Jeffrey Leake, a colleague of mine in the Department of Biostatistics here at Johns Hopkins. Jeffrey has a storied history, so to speak. He actually uh, studied with uh, John's story at the University of Washington in his lab while doing a degree in biostatistics. So his work was at the interface of biostatistics and molecular biology and genomics. Did a postdoc at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York came to Hopkins and did some work in the oncology unit and then joined the faculty of biostatistics about two years ago and he does some really cool work in genomics at the interface again of biostatistics and biology and he's also one of the co-editors of the Simply Statistics blog so we'll talk about that as we go on in this interview. So uh, Jeff, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So you've been active, like I said twice already, you've been active in research at the interface of biology and statistics. Can you comment on maybe one or two major contributions to biology or genomics that have been made in conjunction with statistics in the past decade or so? And what, what are the sort of public health implications of that? Right. So that's a great question, and I think, it's, I think it's a really interesting time to be talking about that question because one thing that sort of the genomics revolution has produced is sort of piles and piles of data. A lot of that data has been produced over, I would say, the last 10 or 20 years, has been made publicly available. So websites like the Gene Expression Omnibus have you know thousands of micro-experiments that are available online. You can download the data and just start analyzing it. And so a lot of the research enterprise is now about statistics, right? Mm -hmm. So we have the data, now we need to do something with it. And so a couple of things statisticians have done is, one, at the earlier stages, they've sort of been involved in turning that data, processing that data into you know, uh, the raw data into a more processed form that you can actually do, you know, mm. answer biological questions with. Because the machines that produce these data are really sensitive to things like the ozone in the atmosphere when the machine was running. And so uh, statisticians have been pretty intimately involved in sort of processing those data. Sort of denoising them? and Denoising them, right. So that's almost like a measurement error part of the, 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 the whole enterprise. And then on the other end, sort of the whole idea of personalized or individualized health um, which has sort of become more and more popular over the last couple of years is, is really a statistical inter enterprise as well. It's if we have a lot of measurements about you, how can we use those measurements, say on your genome or on your proteome, how can we use those measurements to make decisions about what therapies will be useful hmm. for you or whether you should get chemotherapy or not or... So it's you know, a big prediction problem. It's a very big prediction problem and a hard one because, you know, you're projecting <laughs> a long ways out into the future. So, you know, like they say, you know, prediction's hard, particularly when you're trying to predict into the future. Exactly. And so it, it's a very hard problem. And I think that it, it's entirely sort of a statistical problem now, right? The, the data collection is still happening and that's a huge component of it. But there's a huge statistical enterprise in how do we turn these measurements into something that tells us something about what's going to happen to you clinically or, or, or sort of in a more public health uh, Excellent. sort of problem as well. Excellent. So personalized medicine is one of the things you see developing and being improved upon in the future. Absolutely. So as, you know, as co-editor of the Simply Statistics blog, I mean, and an active statistician, right. you, and you've clearly from your last answer, you have a finger on the pulse of statistics and biostatistics. So aside from personalized medicine, do you see any other notable opportunities for statistics right. and biostatistics in the next few years? I, yeah, I think the sort of the world is the oyster of <laughs> statisticians right now. It, it, not just statisticians trained as such, but even people who have a little bit of knowledge about statistics and a, a scientific interest. And so the reason for that, I think, um, is that there are a lot of sort of sources of data that were never available before that, that are now. So I, I mentioned before for sort of genomic applications, there are websites where there are you know, microarray data sets and things like that. Governments are now releasing all of their data to the public and uh, including trying to develop sort of applications and things like that based on government data. Um, the, there's sort of the social network data and mm -hmm. all that that's also sort of becoming a, a flood. And so I think the, the real question is sort of what can't you do with statistics? And, and really the, the harder part is coming up with the, the question. You know, what's the right question right. to ask? Mm -hmm. you know? And I think we're still in the early stages of that. I think we, we, for before there was not much data, but lots of good questions. Now there's tons of data, and we're still trying to figure out the right questions <laughs> right, to ask. Exactly. You know, and uh, once that once somebody has a good question, though the data is available, then it's a matter of you know applying statistics to that. So I think there's a lot of opportunity in in sort of public health and biostatistics and genomics where I work, but also in areas like social network analysis and areas like you know government analysis of government data to sort of 
help you know the citizens become you know either to solve problems or to sort of inform people about you know risks or potholes in their neighborhood or whatever so I mean it's been interesting just recently you know all the uh, int uh, uh, information that's come out about using Google searches to predict sort right. of localized flu epidemics and that sort of thing. You know? Right, so, so the whole Google flu big trans data thing. Food. Yeah, exactly. So it's just uh, this big data and this real-time dynamic data collection is, is starting, to be, that, starting to be... And the interesting thing is how much of that is now available to anybody you know, exactly. with an internet connection. Now you've got R and these free software. So it's, it's really a matter of having the statistical skill because all the other pieces are kind of out there and available and you don't even have to pay for them. So it's sort of an exciting time. I, I don't know if there's been a time where there's been so much opportunity to tackle these problems with such a low startup cost in terms of money. Maybe there's a big, a relatively big startup cost in terms of education, but now we're seeing sort of free online courses and things like that as well on these sorts of areas. So it's really a good time to jump into these sort of, into those areas. Speaking of jumping into it, many students in this class are jumping yeah. into the statistics for maybe the first time or maybe right. the second or third time, okay. uh, but we're trying to give them a good appreciation for the fundamentals of you know good statistical practice, right. how to interpret the results from statistical methods, and give them some of the greatest hits of important statistical right. models to deal with things like uh, multiple predictors and multiplicity right. of predictors and adjusting for confounding, et cetera, so we get into linear models, et cetera. Right. How, how important are these sort of fundamentals of statistics in, in your everyday kind of work? The, it, the crazy thing is how, you know, it's, it's almost magnified. So we, we work in genomics. I work in genomics. We have a lot of sort of high dimensional data sets where they've measured things like the level of expression of every gene in your body, you know, for every person in the study. So that's, you know, 20 or 30,000 variables for everybody that you're studying. And so instead of having, you know, one or two, you know, it's not just height and blood pressure and a few right. other things. It's, you know, these 20,000 variables. And it turns out that good experimental design and dealing with confounding and, and sort of these basic fundamental principles end up being hugely important to being able to get sort of anything out of the, these data because, you know, instead of just, con, you know, confounding instead of affecting one variable, now it affects, you know, 15,000 variables at a time. And so the signal, sort of the signal from the confounders can, can be huge. And right. So it can really overwhelm the exactly. actual signal from the exposure, right? Exactly. And it's also because the data are so high dimensional and it's sort of something that not a lot of people have a lot of intuition about, you know, like knowing what a particular gene, what OCT4 expression means in your body. Most people wouldn't know what that means, you know, without knowing a little bit about the background. And so uh, data visualization, exploratory data analysis is a huge component of being able to figure out, you know, you want to be able to visually see what sort of patterns are happening in your data. And so there's a there's kind of a big push towards building new and more interactive data visualizations that let people sort of dig into these problems at the at the exploratory side. Sort of well. multi-dimensional extensions of histograms and box plots and that sort of thing. Exactly. Yeah. And even histograms and box plots well, end true. up They're playing huge. a huge yeah. role mm -hmm. in this sort of enterprise. So I mentioned before, you know, the no denoising of microarray data. Mm -hmm. One of the the key early steps was people, you know, made histograms of the gene expression in one for one person. You know, they had the twenty thousand measurements for one person. They made a histogram, and then they showed that same histogram for a bunch of different people, and they saw that they were shifted and they were different distributions. And it didn't look like it was biology. It was because of a technical problem hmm. with the machine. So even making histograms ended up being something that helped Insightful. solve one of these sort of major problems. So. Even you know the stuff you learn in your first statistics class can end up having a big impact later on if you sort of think carefully about what you want to look at. So absolutely excellent. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, I mean, in this course we spend a lot of time actually in the second term discussing confounding, right? Uh, and we show how to adjust outcome exposure associations right. for pot potential confounding variables, you know, using stratification and multivariate yeah. regression models. Um, but we generally talk about this in the context of sort of person-level, population-based observational studies. Right. But as you've eloquently pointed out in your work and talking here now, uh, the threat of confounding is ever present in sort of laboratory-based studies as well. Right. So uh, can you sort of, something you alluded to in the last question, the technical glitch, can you right. sort of elaborate on the issues related to batch effects, if you yeah. will, in biological studies and explain what they are and how they manifest themselves? Yeah, so this is an, uh, an issue that sort of, I guess, uh, relatively, I think people saw it from a long time ago, but sort of the, statistic, the statistical approach to batch effects has actually kind of more recently been developed, sort mm -hmm. of in the last four or five years. And so the key issue is that the machines that we use to measure these high dimensional genomic measurements are really, really sensitive. And so that's good because that means we can measure a lot of things with high precision all at the same time. But it's bad because they're sensitive to a bunch of other variables. 
So like I mentioned, ozone in the atmosphere at the time the machine is run. It's also, there have been really interesting studies that show the experience of the graduate student who actually pipetted <laughs> the, you know, the samples onto the plate. That actually can be very highly correlated with the measurements that you actually ultimately get out from the technology. And so all of these things, all these technical variables, one sort of overarching term people have used for that is called batch, a batch effect. And the reason why is because the most common variable we have measured, the data analysts actually see, is the time that the hmm. microarray was run. And that tends to be correlated with which student ran it, right. what the ozone was, all this. So it's correlated with all the variables you want to know, uh, but we actually have that measurement. And so what people were very first, when people were very first looking at this problem from a statistical perspective, they started correlating gene expression patterns with the date the arrays were processed. And so it turns out it's very, very highly correlated with the date. In a lot of experiments, In right? a lot of experiments. And the problem then, getting back to your question about confounding is, so it turns out a lot of people also, because of the experimental design, uh, the batch variable or the date variable is often very correlated with whatever outcome they're looking at, you know, cancer versus normal or something else. And so then it gets to confounding, right? Because the batch variable is correlated with gene expression, but it's also correlated with, with the phenotype the, or the, the phenotype condition that you're or, yeah. interested in. Mm -hmm. So as you, you know, that's a, the standard definition of confounding in a regression model. And so you need to sort of adjust for that if you want to get sort of sensible results out. And so the problem is, is uh, that, that we've worked on a lot in my group has been to figure out ways to, even if you only know this batch variable and maybe there are four or five other confounders you didn't measure, how do you extract those from the high dimensional data directly in such a way that then you can adjust for them later in your analysis. Got it. So the extraction of these things is the first pursuit of the problem. Exactly. And then when you actually ultimately do adjustment, it, it goes back to the classical linear models. It's, it's I mean, just classical regression, regression models that we study in this class, basically, yeah. Absolutely. And so it ends up being a very simple classical linear model with adjustment for confounders. That so we, it's actually we've first measuring those je ne sais quoi, if you will, of confounders exactly. before you put them in the model, right? And we can do that because we have these 15,000 measurements or 20,000 measurements on every person. And so you can kind of see the patterns using exploratory data analysis even. You can kind of see patterns that appear in the data that don't appear to be biology and they're not the measured batch variable that we have. So it must be you know, some other variable, some other confounder that, that might be involved in the data set. So. Excellent. So we can estimate them directly. And Jeff's written some really cool papers about this. Thanks. Thanks. So I want to thank you for coming out today. I right. totally appreciate what my st the students in the class do. Okay. And we've learned Thanks. a lot in this session. So until next time, I'm John McGrady. This is Jeff Leake. See you later.